Um, and I've worked a lot on proposals related to Python 3, so I and, uh, and I was there at Google. Uh, gave me a high five, then he went home. Uh, not very eventful. Uh, basically, I'm saying this just because, A, I've been using Python 3 for a very long time, uh, so I do have an informed opinion, but I also do have a biased opinion, so take that how, however you will, uh, but I just want to be upfront about that. Uh, so just to go over what I'm planning to basically cover here is basically the features of Python 3. So if you've only been using 2.7 up to this point and haven't been keeping up, I'm going to try to go over basically all the features, so I'm going to go a little fast. Uh, but then after that, I'm going to cover uh, performance numbers based on the Alignment Swallow benchmarks, uh, comparing 2.7 to 3.3 so that you can both see in terms of pr programming productivity, whether Python 3.3 is worth it, but also whether performance-wise it's also worth it. Um, so that's the structure, sorry, I'm side ahead. Uh, but basically my hope is, is when you guys leave this room, you're going to go out going, you know what, I want to be working on Python 3.3. And hopefully you will, or if you've got things holding you back, hopefully talk to people like Massimo to port their things to Python 3, which I know he's working on, uh, et cetera, et cetera, so that you feel excited and actually want to do this and not go, oh, I'm just going to stay on 2.7 for the rest of my life until someone prides it for my cold, dead hands. Um, so yeah, so let's just go straight into it. Um, so I'm going to first start with features. Um, so there's a bunch of stuff that we've had in, uh, since Python 2.7, if not Python 2.6, that kind of came out of the development of Python 3. Um, there's various things that require a feature statement, such as absolute import, Unicode literals, uh, quote, new division, it's actually been around for a very long time with the idea that if you divide an int by an int, such as three divided by two, you get back 1.5 instead of just one. Uh, the print print is a function instead of a statement, uh, which, by the way, is really nice. So I, I advise you to do that if you're using 2.7. Um, we also have set literals, set and dict comprehensions, uh, context managers on the same line without having to use uh, contextlib.nested, um, the C-based I/O library so that you can get really fast uh, I/O stuff. Uh, memory views, which, by the way, were completely rewritten uh, in Python 3.3 to be much more um, complete and following the PEP standard because the original implementer got m kind of most of the way and then left, and then someone finally just said, forget this, I'm going to fix it. So Python 3.3 fixes any issues with that. Um, also in Python 2.7, if you prefer to use like map and zip and such uh, as iterators instead of uh, actual list, you can use the future built-ins module and that will actually give you those versions of the built-ins uh, right now in, point, in Python 2.7, uh, which are really, really nice. Um, some little new syntax or exceptions, uh, except the exception as exe allows, instead of having to use the comma to capture the uh, actual exception instance. Uh, Stir dot format, um, which if you used in 2.6 might have found a little annoying, uh, but in 2.7 we fixed uh, adding the ability to kind of implicitly auto number the fields. So before in 2.6, those curly braces you would have had to have said zero and one regardless, but as of 2.7 and I've seen Python 3.1, uh, uh, you can leave it out and we'll just figure out, oh, that's supposed to be zero and that's supposed to be one. It's really, really handy. Uh, and just by the way, um, stir dot format's a little bit better than using uh, the mod operator for doing things with internationalization and Unicode and other things, so it's really, really nice. Um, and then there's a number module if you're really into mathematics that properly hier uh, has a proper hierarchy of uh, types such as fractional and imaginary and all that stuff. Um, there are various features that are exclusive to Python 3 that don't really require an entire slide to explain to a bunch of Python programmers. Uh, so Dix now use views uh, when you call uh, items or values or keys on a Dix object uh, so that they actually pull from the actual object so you don't have weighted memory recopying bringing up this list. Uh, comparison against disparate types is a type error. What's greater than two or the letter A? If you're using sense, you might use both type errors so you don't accidentally mix up your um, you can no longer use old style uh, exception formatting of raise exception, then comma, and then the message you would pass in. That's gone, it's cleaned up, you have to use parentheses now. Uh, strings exceptions are always also gone if you're still using 2.6. Uh, meta classes got a little easier, a little cleaned up. Uh, there's now a meta class class argument, so you can go class to print meta class equals instead of having to use an under under meta class in the class body. Uh, it's a little cleaner. Uh, and there's also now a prepare method, uh, under under prepare method you, that you can override that gets called with the things that are evaluated in the body of the meta class. So you can use like an older dicks and then 
suddenly now under under dict we're not actually in order dict we actually know the order of things we declared in the class we get so that's kind of a thing uh the siren library's gotten cleaned up if you hate the new names i'm sorry that's my fault um arc parse got added so if you want a more up-to-date uh, argument pa um, parsing library instead of get opt or opt parse arc parse is there um Logging got completely redone in terms of their configuration using dictionaries, so it's a lot easier to use that way. Uh, WSGI got some bugs fixed up, so if you're on um, web stuff, that got moved, added into the standard library in Python 3. Uh, super no longer requires arguments, so you can just go do super, and now it'll do what you expect. Um, we unified integers, so no more long, so no more big integer numbers with an L at the end. It's all just one type, and we just do what has to happen behind the scenes. Uh, and we renamed the next method on generators and iterators to be under, under, next to match pretty much everything else the way we tend to word things in Python. Um, in terms of specific added things to Python 3.3, if you've been keeping up with the features through 3.2, um, we've completely reworked the OS and IO exception hierarchy, so you shouldn't have to capture um, like OS error and look at the error no uh, attribute to try to figure out what kind of exception it was. You can now just catch file not found error a lot easier to work with. Uh, we had a couple of new modules, LVMA, which is a compression, compression format that's getting a little popular in the Linux world. Uh, IP address module, which helps you parse IP addresses, including IPv6. Uh, the fault handler module, which lets you handle exactly what it sounds like, faults, so you can get interrupts easily and help, helps you debug situations when those get triggered. Um, the email package has a new policy and header API and is overall just flat out better as usual. Um, I've been working on it very hard to try to straighten out all the Unicode intricacies there. Uh, another nice little thing is we, uh, dictionaries now share their keys. Uh, this is a big deal if you use object-oriented code, which I suspect most of you do, because I don't know if you realize it, but every object has its namespace stored in a dictionary. So in under under dict, it's literally just a dictionary storing every single attribute. Well, let's say you have a class foo and you create a thousand copies of it, all right? you might probably have five standard attributes you set on that, on those instances. Well, that's a waste of space to have the same five strings duplicated a thousand times each. With this, you don't have to do that anymore. What happens behind the scenes is you reuse that same string on all the keys, and thus you don't waste the space. So you can end up with a 10 to 20% memory savings without any performance loss uh, in object-oriented programming uh, code. So really nice big things there if you're worried about memory. So there's a couple slides here where that's going to be on individual slides just because it's a little more complicated. Uh, I swear this is the most amount of code people see on a single slide. Uh, something in Python 3 added was called non-local. Basically, prior to Python 3, Python's scoping was local, global, built-in, and that's it. So if you had a closure, um, there was no way to say, you know what, I want the variable that is not always at the global scope, but is in local. So basically, the closure itself, you wanted to somehow be able to communicate it because before it was only A will get zero, C will get four, but everything left over, one, two, and three, will get shoved into B. So it lets for really nice um, unpacking. Obviously, you can only have one asterisk labeled variable, but it makes it nice and easy to build it in line uh, actual unpacking of iterables when you don't know how many values you're gonna have. Uh, a big thing for you people who work with Git extensions is uh, we've gained now a stable API, which means basically if you write code to this stable API and compile, uh, you don't ever have to compile again for another version of Python. So you can do the compilation once for the target OS, and that's it. You should basically be good for life, so you never have to upload another version onto PyPI for version of Python 3.3, 3.4, 3.5, or 3.6. Uh, so really, really handy, really, really nice for just reading your library. Uh, and current job features, for those of you who like to uh, have to do a lot of 
basically it's a module that tries to make it really, really simple to um, either use threads, use a thread pool, or process those actions with uh, do comparison uh, parallel operations. So like in this case, if you do a big calculation, which is basically like any number to the power of a million, uh, if you just do nap over that, over uh, 20, uh, 0 to 19, uh, that takes about six seconds, at least on this laptop. But using a process pool from computer.preacher tool tip, you can see is a with statement with an import and using consecutor.map instead of nap, it does it in one second. Really simple, really straightforward uh, way to get uh, correlation. No, not having to figure out how to use multi-processing, no having to touch the threads. And so if you go and execute and it'll do its thing, it's in its pulse right back. Um, something new in Python 3.3 is the decimal module. It's now been re-implemented in C. Um, those are not typos in terms of the speed improvement. You literally average 30 times faster now in Python 3.3 with any decimal work. And some bus marks have shown spe speed ups of up to 80 times. Uh, oh, is it 120? Okay. Uh, Larry Hastings in the front row just informed me that apparently no met some bus marks are now up to 120 times faster. Uh, so if you're using decimal uh, stuff, you definitely, definitely, definitely want to think about moving to Python 3.3. Uh, it's actually so fast now, there's been slight discussion on Python dev about uh, actually adding a native decimal type uh, literal as a way to actually just use decimals instead of floats because it's so fast now. We'll see if that happens in 3.4. Bug Larry, he's the release manager. Um, qualified names, which is handy for debugging, uh, basically, uh, under under name typically is just the rightmost thing in a dotted name for something. So if you have a method in a class and a module, it's not necessarily the full name, but with uh, under under qual name, what you now get is actually the name of a method in the class. So you don't have to do any work to actually figure out, all right, where did this method come from if you just happen to pass a method around. You'll know what class it's attached to. Uh, yield from, this is a new Python 3.3 thing. Um, basically allows you to refactor generators. Um, this quote from Nick Coughlin, uh, yield from is to generators as calls are to functions. Basically think of it as if you have a chunk of code and you want to factor out a section of it, you put it into a function and now it's just a call where it happened to be in that code. Well, this is the exact same thing with generators. If you pull a generator out into a separate generator function, where you took that out, you now just make a yield from call to that function, uh, that generator. And basically what yield, yield from does is it takes an iterator and just continues to yield on each instance, um, each value from that, from that iterator over and over and over again until you're done. Uh, but one of the fancy things about it is if you use send or any of the other methods that are special to generators for sending things back into the generator, it will actually send it through the call chain to the function that is being called by yield from. It won't just be where the yield statement is, it will actually go up the call chain as necessary. Uh, this is kind of a big deal because Guido and a bunch of people on Python Ideas have actually been discussing coming up with a standard asynchronous loop uh, interface and way to do asynchronous work in Python. And Guido is absolutely enamored with yield from, and this will probably play into the asynchronous work that uh, will hopefully go into Python 3.4. Yes, and yield from's also smart about exceptions. Uh, if you like virtual env, you will love it even more in Python 3.3 because it's now included as part of Python. Uh, does anyone here not know what virtual env is? It's okay if you don't. Okay, everyone does. Fantastic. So basically, virtual env becomes uh, venv, and it becomes a module, so you can use dash m to execute it, or you can just use pyvenv as a built as an installed command and it will give you a uh, virtual env for Python 3.3. And it's even a little smaller because now um, on Windows, I think, I believe it's typically a copy, and on Linux, it's just a symlink, so there's actually even less space used up by a virtual env environment uh, in Python 3.3 thanks to vmv. Okay, even bigger features that take multiple slides. Um, so we're gonna start with exceptions. Uh, these got reworked a lot in Python 3. Uh, one thing is the traceback object is now attached to an exception, 
So on any exception, there's an under under traceback uh, attribute which you can use to actually look at the actual traceback for the call. So as you can see here, you can just use the traceback module and actually just do the exact work that Python would have done for you. Um, we also added the concept of implicit exception chaining. So let's say you've got an exception that was raised, you catch it, and uh, some other exception happens. Whether you explicitly raise something or during your handling of that exception, you trigger another exception like accidentally dividing by zero or whatever. Um, what happens is, is a under under context attribute on the exception gets set and what happens is, is you get a trace back of every single exception that somehow came to be during that call. So as you can see here, exceptions first printed out because we explicitly raised that but then when we raised not, Im not implemented error you get a little message saying during handling of the above exception another exception occurred. So there's no more loss of exception information. So if you trigger an exception while handling another exception, it's all there for you to fully be able to debug exactly what went wrong first, what went wrong second, et cetera, et cetera, all the way down to the final exception that triggered. So no more loss of information. Really, really, really handy. Um, but uh, you might not always, always want it to be implicit, so now it can be explicit. Uh, we added a little bit of syntax uh, where you can say uh, raise not implemented error from exception and it will set what's called the uh, under under clause field. And as you notice the, f the uh, message is a little different, the above exception was the direct cause of the following exception. So this is when you explicitly want to make the statement, okay, well this was caused by this but now you really should view this as another type of exception or, what, or whatever use you want. Uh, one change in Python 3.3 is if you say from none it will actually suppress that attribute so if a previous Checker code set it, this will actually turn it off. Um, basically, it's a lot like uh, the previous slide about context, but just allowing you to have contro more control over exactly what's get set. Uh, import got a m bunch of upgrades over the lifetime of Python 3. Um, so, you can go to my talk tomorrow about more details on this, but basically, uh, at least in Python 3.3, import has been completely rewritten in pure Python and from the, Py from the import lib module or package. Uh, so basically what this allows is easier customization because all the stuff in import has now been broken up into individual uh, importer objects. Um, it should allow people to more easily write their own custom ones if you're doing that. Um, the logic of import as a whole from a high in the sky view is much, much, much easier to comprehend. Uh, and various other things like if you use NFS it's like 20, it's like five times faster or something. Uh, anyway, come to my talk tomorrow if you want more details on that. Um, there's now a more finer grained import lock for any of you who work with threads and have accidentally deadlocked Python by launching a thread that happens to import a module. Uh, those days are basically gone. Uh, usually this happened where you would launch a thread and that thread would call a function and that function would have a local import statement. That would cause a deadlock because you basically just can't have import in one thread and then another import in another thread and basically contention on the import lock just froze up. Uh, Antoine Petru in Python 3.3 made it um, the lock per module. So basically it tries to detect circular imports and if that happens it basically says okay, this module I can't block until this is finished so I'm just going to let it, let you go forward with an incomplete import but at least it won't lock up. And if it n realizes it's not a circular import, it'll let whatever import in some thread finish. And once that's done, give up the lock and let the other thread continue. So, uh, circular import deadlocks basically are, are no longer an issue. Uh, another thing that's been added into Python is uh, what's called uh, what are under under pi cache directories. Uh, this was done by the Linux di distributions. Basically, all your PYC files they're no longer next to your PY files. They go in a subdirectory called uh, under under pi cache. Uh, other than keeping everything nice and clean now in your directories, because uh, now you just have a new directory instead of n number of files with n being the number of source files you have, uh, all the files now are prefixed with the um, interpreter name, so like C Python uh, and the version number, so like 3.3. .3. And what that means is, is you can reuse the same s source code for multiple versions of Python and the .pyc files will not get rewritten. So you don't have to waste that time anymore. So if you use Python 3, Python 3.3, 3.4, whatever, you can use on the same source code. They'll all have their own .py code files, um, .pyc files. They won't get rewritten or anything and they'll all stick around and you don't have to deal with that mess anymore. Um, and 
another new feature with imports uh, and packaging is uh, namespace packages, which are new in Python 3.3. Uh, there's always been a slight problem with very, very large packages, such as Twisted, that have like separate sections, like uh, or Zope is a good example, like Zope.interfaces and uh, other sections of Zope that are always packaged and shipped independently, it was always kind of hard for like Linux, Linux distributions to kind of support those without somehow munging them together into one directory because you want all of them to look under the Zope name, right? So they have to be under the Zope directory and somehow you've got to package them all together. Well with namespace packages what now happens is, is Python will look down sys.path for every single directory that doesn't have an under under init under under dot pi file but with the same directory name. So if you have zope slash interfaces, zope slash, I don't know, foo or whatever, huh? Database, thank you, uh, or whatever in separate directories, we will notice that, package them all together and give you a single package object that has an under under path set to look in all those locations. So you can now actually install all of those um, packages separately as uh, under a single upper level namespace like Zope, but still have them in individual directories for like interfaces, database, what have you. Um, I should also mention it's fully backwards compatible, so you don't have to worry about changing your code right now. So if you're using under internet files, Python 3.3 is not going to do something wrong or anything or anything like that. This only happens if the, all the directories found do not have the under under init file. Uh, if you've ever seen an import warning before, about an empty directory, those basically now go away and those turn into namespace packages. Uh, functions have been surprisingly updated somewhat. Uh, one nice thing that's been added to Python 3 is keyword only arguments. So basically if you have a point where you have a single um, asterisk in your parameter list, everything that comes to the right of that list is now keyword only. So you can't use positional arguments to actually set that value, you must explicitly use the name of the argument to call it. This becomes really, really handy when you extend an API because if you originally took two positional arguments and you had a third argument that you don't want people to accidentally pass three arguments for and kind of spill into, you now make it a keyword only argument and you can now expand your API. People will not accidentally pass too many arguments and suddenly start using your new API when you meant for them to use the old one, they'll get the proper error. Let's say explicitly say, I want to use this new argument. Uh, function annotations. Uh, people always clamored for ways to kind of mark up the parameter list of a function. So usually people say they want types, but it doesn't specifically have to be that. But they wanted some way to be able to say, all right, this argument has some special meaning, this other argument has a meaning, uh, their turn value has some special meaning. So function annotations were added as a syntactic way to basically attach one object to another in the uh, parameter list. Uh, as I said, people tend to think of these as ways of adding types to arguments, but is in no way have anything specifically to do about types. Basically, anything that comes after that colon or that uh, right arrow can be any single object that's within scope when this function is created. So it can be a string, it could be a number, it can be any object you want. It does not have to be a type. Uh, we do not use it in the center library on purpose because we did not want to give the community an idea of what to do with this. We specifically left it open so that all of you can use it and let us know how the community decides they want to use this syntax. Basically, we just realized people wanted this kind of thing, so we just said, all right, here it is. You figure out how to use it and you come back and tell us how you actually want to see it used in, uh, moving forward. Uh, function signature objects are a new thing in Python 3.3. Uh, it makes it a lot easier to introspect on objects in terms of what their parameters are. Um, yeah. It's literally just adding metadata to your parameter list. So you can literally just, so if you see A colon spam comma B colon bacon, all that does is your function object now, um, has an association of the spam object with the parameter A and the bacon object with parameter B, and that's it. But like let's say you want to have a decorator that says, okay, any argument that is, has spam attached to it, 
eat it, and if it's got bacon on it, don't eat it. Whatever you want. The point is, is it's now just attached to the function object, so you can introspect on it, get that information back, and, and do whatever you want. Some people like to use that as documentation, right? So some people would go a colon and then a string saying, uh, I don't know, number of things to call, and b colon uh, WYSIWYG thingamajig. You can use it for whatever you want. It's literally just attaching metadata to a function. So the error is supposed to represent the return value. So it's the exact same thing. It's just because there's no name for the return value, we had to come up with something to be able to give you the equivalent. So that's all that does. Anything else? No. Okay. Uh, function signature trap is great. So new in Python 3.3 related to function annotations. This is another way to kind of introspect and look at your functions uh, more closely. Uh, basically, there's a new um, interface in the inspect module uh, that uh, Larry helped with uh, that uh, basically makes it much, much easier to actually introspect on a function and its uh, parameter list. So it's all object oriented now. It's not a bunch of list and tuples like it was with the inspect module before this with full arg spec. If you know what I'm talking, if you know what that function is, this gives you an object oriented version of that function basically. Uh, What's also nice is you can now use this to attach it to extension, uh, C extension code. So now you can actually kind of define in Python code what the uh, parameters are supposed to be for your C code. So if you end up with, if we end up with tools that use this to try to figure certain things out about your functions, you should be able to attach this to your C func extensions and suddenly they can also participate in the tooling. Uh, Unicode, Unicode, Unicode. All right, so obviously a lot of stuff about Unicode. I'm sure uh, you've all heard about certain things about Unicode, but we'll work our way up the stack. Uh, so the first thing is, is all source code in Python 3 is UTF-8. Uh, this also means that you can now have non-ASCII identifiers. So for those of you that want to use accented characters such as in Spanish, uh, such as uh, accent over the E or whatever, you can actually now use that in your identifier names. You're no longer limited to just ASCII. Uh, we don't support all of the entire Unicode uh, space, but we do support a good chunk of it. So basically, you should be able to write uh, variable names in your native language with accents, and you won't have any more problems. So no more coding statements at the top of your code, basically. Um, Unicode literals. So obviously, you hear a lot about Python 3 and how much of a pain it is to deal with this new concept of all string literals and Python 3 being Unicode. Uh, basically what's, what you can do is view it as um, there are three kinds of strings, uh, basically, three kinds, three kinds of literals. Uh, there's what you could call a native string, which is uh, a string in Python 2 or Python 3 with no um, prefix. So in Python 2. Point, it's always the str type when you specify it that way. So obviously in 2.7 that means it's ASCII, in Python 3 it means it's Unicode. Uh, this was this concept comes from uh, certain people who really, really, really want really, really fast performance and they know they're only working with ASCII or binary in Python 2.7 and they just kind of wanted to just really work as low as possible. So this concept comes from them. I don't really recommend it, but that's just me. Um, there's a, then there's the Unicode string, right? Like in Python 2, if you specify something with U in front, it's Unicode. In Python 3, well, in Python 3.3, that's actually Unicode as well. Uh, we added in Python 3.3 the ability to specify the U prefix, and it's a no-op. It means absolutely nothing to Python 3.3, but if you're writing Python 2.7 code that you also want to work in Python 3.3, you can now specify all your Unicode strings with the U prefix, and it'll just work also in Python 3.3. You don't have to use 2 to 3 to strip that off or anything like that. Uh, so it was added in 3.3 to make it much easier for you guys to write code that works in both versions. And uh, obviously there's the bytes type, uh, which in 2.7 is actually an alias for star and an actual proper bytes type in Python 3. Uh, and as, as always, uh, you can use uh, from under under future import Unicode literals if you just want to force all your string literals to be uh, Unicode. Um, as I said, a lot of people view this as the big supporting uh, hurdle for going from Python 2 to Python 3. As long as you're very clear in your code about what works with Unicode and what works with strings from a 2.7 perspective or bytes versus string in Python 3, the porting is really not that hard at all. It's fairly straightforward. It's just if you haven't really worked your APIs out to say, all right, this is supposed to work with strings and this is supposed to work with bytes, it gets 
really, really messy. As soon as you separate those two um, ideas, it's much easier to pour and it's not a big deal at all. Uh, the other big thing is actually during execution in Python 3.3, uh, Unicode usage has gotten a lot better. Um, basically, under the hood, all strings now in Python 3.3 are either stored as Latin 1, uh, UTF-16, or UTF-32. So either 8, 16, or 32 bits uh, per character. Uh, and we automatically uh, upgrade strings, as it were, based on when you introduce new characters that require bigger storage. Uh, the big thing is, is no more narrow versus wide builds, for those of you who know what I'm talking about. Uh, basically, you can view everything as a wide build, but without taking up all the space. Um, if you don't know what I'm talking about, you can always compile Python to store strings internally as UTF-16 or UTF-32. Uh, Windows and Mac OS X have always used narrow, so UTF-16. Linux has always used uh, UTF-32. Uh, this is why you'll see C extensions that specify they were compiled on a narrow build versus a wide build. Uh, that's all now gone in Python 3.3. Um, in terms of memory consumption, if you were using a narrow build with a Django benchmark uh, that Martin von Lois, who did help do this work, uh, used, it's uh, a little less than 8% smaller to use 2.7, but if you're using a wide build, uh, Python 3.3 actually uses less memory by more than 9%. So once again, with that and the key sharing, memory usage in Python 3.3 has actually gone down a good amount and is less than Python 2.7. Okay, so. Those are all the new features. This is what, that all makes your life easier and better as a programmer, right? It's not revolutionary, it was meant to be an evolution, but it was an abrupt evolution because we wanted to get this done now instead of later because had we done all that individually, version by version by version, I'd be dead by the time we finished. Um, I didn't want, none of us wanted to wait that long. So that's why we did some things that broke compatibility. But the point is, is all this is meant to make Python a much cleaner and better language. And as someone who's programmed in Python 3, point, in Python 3 for a very long, for years now, I have to admit, I find it a much nicer, cleaner language to work with. And when I have to go back to Python 2, I'm still happy, but I do end up missing Python 3. Uh, I, I know Larry agrees with me, and pretty much everyone I know who's actually done any coding in Python 3 has always agreed that it's just a nicer language. So. It makes you more productive, you're a happier person. Great, all right. Is it gonna be fast enough for your needs? Now, hopefully it is and already was and you just view Python as a great language and always fast enough and you're not gonna worry about it, but I know some of you do. So, what I did was is I ported the Unlaid and Swallow benchmarks to Python 3, at least as much as possible, uh, including the benchmarks from uh, PyPy as well that you can see at speed.pypy.org. Uh, basically, I checked out the code for 2.7, uh, 3.3, Compiled them. Uh, I used a wide build for 2.7 uh, to give it, make, make it more equal, and I assume a lot of people are on Linux for server stuff, so I just figured he, I'll just do wide, and honestly, I was lazy and didn't want to have to run the benchmarks twice. Um, all the, because this is the only in Swallow benchmarks, everything's relative to each other, so it's going to be X percentage faster or slower compared to each other. Uh, I used two different machines. I used this laptop, which will be the red bars you'll see in the chart shortly. And then I used my work machine uh, at Google. Uh, that's the blue bars, and I sorted it against that, and it's got 36 cores across several CPU. I mean, it's a big, fast desktop, basically, that runs uh, Ubuntu, uh, runs uh, Linux. So we've got Linux on a really fast machine, Mac laptop, um, and yeah, so basically. Uh, I'm ignoring some tests though, just to be, just because the variance between the two machines was so ridiculous, it just seemed like something was really off, potentially with the benchmarks. So there were some that were really bad on Linux, but good on OS X, like iterative count. Uh, there was up to a 50, uh, a 52% difference bet on the same version of Python between the performance and threaded count was 117% difference. Uh, it's just so variable, it just didn't really make any good sense. Uh, it seemed like more, o more an OS issue than actual uh, interpreter version. Uh, in Queens was 19% different, uh, the same version of Python between the two machines. Uh, Regex FBOT and Startup No Sight, both of those weren't so great. Um, the Telco benchmark, which uses decimal, uh, was... <laughs> 
literally you're reading that right. Uh, basically, 1,033 times different between the two machines, uh, which is obviously ridiculous. Uh, it's extremely fast on Python 3.3, but it varied so much I left it out of the charts and also skewed the numbers because you end up with this huge bar in Python 3.3 standard and you can't read the numbers because it goes from like zero to 100 times better. Um, anyway, so. As a really, 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 really rough, don't ever quote me on this uh, way of seeing whether or not Python 3.3 is faster. If you take all of the benchmarks that have been ported to work with Python 3.3 and 2.7 and sorted them, uh, the median benchmark is 5% slower. So basically, it's within the range of a GCC upgrade. 5% uh, is nothing. I mean, that's. My machine may have hiccuped while I was running that benchmark, literally. It's basically, you can consider 2.7 and Python 3.3 equivalent. So no need to worry about performance. You're going to be fast enough on Python 3.3. Now, to show that I'm not exactly lying, uh, the worst benchmark is no site startup. So if you use Python s and basically give it a pass argument, um, it is 3.53 times slower on Python 3.3 compared to Python 2.7 which is actually a lot faster than it was on Python 3.2. Uh, basically, there's a lot more stuff imported at startup in Python 3.3. Um, some would argue it makes it more correct because we have to do so much more with Unicode in terms of your file system and standard in, standard out, and just various other things. So it's just slower because we have to do a lot more like that. Uh, but being upfront, it is slower that way. Um, as I said, though, Telco is blazing fast. Uh, on my machine at work, uh, it is 53.18 times faster under Python 3 than it is under Python 2. Uh, once again, thanks to the rewrite of decimal in uh, as a C extension. Um, so without any labels, this is, this is what the performance numbers look like. As I said, blue is my work machine uh, running Linux with 36 cores and reds this laptop. Uh, as you can see, some benchmarks are a lot faster on Python 2.7, which is going left, and some benchmarks are a lot faster on Python 3.3, which is going right. Uh, those numbers are percentages, so 0.4 is 40%. Uh, um, basically, it just depended on the benchmark. There was no great correlation of, oh, 2.7 is always faster, or 3.3 is always faster. It was just sometimes one was faster than the other, and other times it wasn't. Uh, so it pretty much is a tie, in my opinion. Um, if you look at the synthetic benchmarks, once again, pretty much split down the middle if you just sort by performance. Uh, startup was slow on Python 3.3, but like loading JSON was really fast. Uh, just various little things. Uh, one thing to mention is with the regex compilation, uh, we found potentially a over the complicated LRU cache implementation in Funk Tools that's kind of making that performance slow because every regex you compile gets cached. Uh, so those numbers will hopefully get better in Python 3.4. But as a, but basically, it's choose one or the other, but sorted, it's equal. It's just going to vary from benchmark to benchmark. Uh, if you do a more algorithmic uh, benchmark sort, once again, it's kind of, depending on which machine you look at, split down the middle or a lot more in Python 3's favor. Uh, as I said, I always sort by um, my work machine, which is blue, so that's why it's um, sorted that way. But whether you look at anything from chaos, where uh, 2.7 is better by 20%, or you look at the end body benchmark, which shows 3.3 better by 30%, sorted, it splits down the middle. Uh, so yeah, it's still pretty equal. Uh, the one you people, most people probably care about is the macro benchmarks. So this is taking actual library code and frameworks and writing a benchmark to actually use them uh, from beginning to end. Uh, I should, uh, in the next slide, I'll actually show the exact numbers, but as you can see, it's the, this is where the kind of 5% of uh, 2.7 being a little faster, which as I said, is within compiler flags, uh, kind of shows up. Uh, but more or less it's split, as you can see. It's, I should mention Pathlib, one of the reasons it's slower is it does a lot more in Python 3.3 because of certain new APIs in the OS module. Uh, but otherwise, it's, it kind of equals out. Uh, if you actually look at the numbers up close, um, I should mention that Genshi, Django, and HTML5lib all use code that have not been released publicly yet. They're all in their public repo, 
but they just haven't cut a release. Um, so like Django is using 1.5.0 alpha one. So it's not even complete. And as you can see, at worst, it's 7% slower. And that's with alpha code where they've just added the Python 3 support like a couple months ago. Um, so basically, the numbers work out. I mean, like Mako is slower on Python 2.7, but Chameleon is faster on Python 3. So you have two templating libraries, one's faster and one's slower. It honestly keeps all the benchmarks when you look, just basically it's one's faster and one's slower, and it all works out when you sort across all of them to just be right down the middle. And these are the standard benchmarks we've been using for Unlaying Swallow, uh, PyPy has been using. They're not special in any way, and they just all sort out that way. So that's pretty much it. So you can stare at my cat so you have something reasonable to look at while I answer questions. And that's it. Yeah. No. So, oh, do you, Larry? Oh, right. So for those of you that couldn't hear Larry, basically he uses function annotations as a way to declare the command line interface for code. So basically he just says like, this is a flag, this is gonna be an int, it's gonna be this number of extra arguments at the end, and he just specifies those as annotations and then puts a decorator on it, and now when you actually call the code, it actually automatically knows how to use like dash dash foo and how many args to take and all that. So yes, there is, Larry's an example yeah, there's one. Uh, I mean, I, I used it once to do a duck typing uh, example in, in uh, the Python enhancement proposal for the new uh, s signature objects that I mentioned earlier, but that was mainly just as an example, just because I knew that would work. But um, no, I haven't personally seen a lot of use in the wild, but it could quite possibly be there and people just aren't really yelling about it. Do, where does Google? Google or, or who does? Where does Google? Oh, where does Google? Okay. So I got permission to state that uh, Google is moving to Python 3 starting next year. Uh, and Google is the largest user of Python in the world. We have tens of millions of lines of Python code, and we're moving it to Python 3 starting next year. So Google's jumping in and moving forward. So we don't, per we, we, Google moves very slowly in terms of getting these new versions of Python, unfortunately. Like we just got to 2.7. Uh, but uh, starting next year, we're starting to move. Yeah. Uh, no, we just made it available internally for testing like this last half of the year. It won't really start in earnest till next year. As I say, we just got to 2.7. So, anyone else? Yeah. Oh, can the performance be improved in Python 3.3? Yep. So I'm using the so I'm using the versions that'll just be Python 3.3.1 and 2.7. Point whatever the next bug fix version is. Six. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's all the same. Oh, do I think they could optimize it? Uh, I would be surprised if they couldn't. I think they pretty much took a very mechanical view of moving their code over, and I'm sure there's some stuff that they could go, okay, well, we could use map better or do this or use some library or something. It, it'll probably take a while. They're planning to have Django 1.5 have experimental Python 3 support, and I don't think they're planning to really dive in with real support until 
Django 1.6, and I think that's why, because they want time to really look at it and optimize for it, and because, I mean, the way they keep cutting off backwards compatibility versions with their releases, eventually three will be the only thing, and that's when I think that you'll really see them really focus on it. Any other questions? No? Okay. Thanks, everybody. Oh. So I disagree that it's taken that long. I don't agree with that phrasing. Uh, when we started work on Python 3, Guido publicly stated he did not expect it, he did not expect adoption in the, in the community to really, really hit its stride until five years out. Now Python 3.0 was released in December of 2008. So we're approaching four years. And already the top 50, out of the top 50 projects in terms of download on PyPI, 72% uh, of them have fully released version support for Python 3 in some way or another. And another 4% have it in development. So we're already at 72 to 76% of the top 50 projects already supporting Python 3. Uh, I actually did a website called py3ksupport.appspot.com that daily updates to show that number. Uh, so I think, I, I, I wouldn't say it's been slow, I think it's been actually faster than we expected and basically on trajectory for exactly what we wanted. Now, in terms of whether we had done a Python 2.8 and a 2.9 and a 2.10 and been much slower with the changes, sh there wouldn't be an adoption, it'd just be Python then. So there really isn't a way to really view that. So in terms of using the newer features, sure, just because people wouldn't have to necessarily change anything. Uh, but as I said, it would have taken forever to do it. And Guido has always said he would never release a 2.10 because he hates double digits after the decimal point uh, in terms of version numbers. So we were running out of version numbers anyway, so we had to do something. Uh, so I'm actually totally happy with the way it worked. I knew it was gonna be a little while and it was gonna take years for the community to really start going, okay, Python 3 is it, we're gonna get behind it, we're gonna do it. Uh, but all the major libraries I know are moving forward with it, so I'm happy. Anyone else? Anyone? Yes. Oh, uh, so the question was, is any like external libraries like NumPy going to ever make it into the Python centered library? So the answer is no. Uh, as the person who kind of is, is half unofficially in charge of the standard library in terms of that kind of thing, I'm going to say no. Uh, basically, the only stuff that ever gets in the standard library is something that has an extremely stable API and that the community has voiced with their, with their downloads and usage as the way to do something and is basically straightforward and useful to a, either a lot of people, well basically useful to a lot of people. Uh, and NumPy is somewhat niche. It's still changing a lot, and it's big. So that alone will keep NumPy and SciPy, Matplotlib, and all those kinds of stuff out of the standard library. Think of it. Think of it as we're always happy to we're, we're always happy to look at stable utility code to go into the standard library that's been stable for a year and the community likes a lot. But stuff that big, uh, it's just better for the community to keep it out so they can iterate at a much faster rate because we only do a new release every 18 months, right? So making you have to wait 18 months until the next version of NumPy with bug fixes is just not fair, really. Yeah. No, no. Never. <laughs> well, it, I mean, we've always stated that 2.7 is the end of the line for the Python 2. There will be, we promise to do uh, bug fix releases for five years, so that hasn't ended yet, but we've always explicitly stated there will be no Python 2.8. Yeah, I mean, if someone honestly wanted to do a 2.8 
fork? We could maybe keep it on ac.python.org. Uh, Larry is saying Benjamin Peterson said, oh, hell, he'll host it if someone actually ever puts the time and effort into it, but it's a lot of work. Uh, but at least from the core developer's perspective, no, we're, we're 2.7 is it where it's going to be, and we're moving forward with Python 3 full steam ahead and quite happy with where it's going, especially with all the changes we did in 3.3 to make stuff faster and use less memory. We're, we're happy. So, no, no 2.8. Larry, what are our plans for Python 3.4? Larry, for those of you who don't know, is the release manager for Python 3.4, so he'll be the gatekeeper for what does and does not get in. I will start off up front. Since Python 3.3 just came out, we're more worried about bug fixes at this point and getting reports from people about what's not working. Uh, as I said, there has been light discussion about adding a decimal type literal, uh, but beyond that, I don't know what's really planned. I'll let Larry answer, though. The answer, oh, golly, the voice of God. The answer is uh, whatever people contribute. Uh, there is no master plan for Python anymore. There are no features that Guido has written down somewhere in secret that he hasn't gotten around to writing yet. Uh, there's the async protocol that people are talking about, an async um, interface. Um, and that's probably going to happen, and he already mentioned it. Apart from that, there are people who are proposing various things. Nothing is set. Um, and it's all what the community decides needs to be in Python 3.4 and what I allow. Anybody else? Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, in 2.7? Oh, with memory leaks with exceptions? Yeah, so the deal is, is I didn't really go into details about it, but um, Basically, the, the question was, is what about memory leaks with tracebacks? Because you have to realize when you have a traceback, you're basically storing the execution frame uh, for that traceback so you can get the printout per line of what happened and all that. And that's how PDB can actually um, look at variables and stuff. So the deal is, is if you hold on to a traceback, you're holding on the entire execution stack all the way back. And that's a huge memory leak if you like shove that into a dict or a tuple or something. Uh, that's not a problem in terms of the under under traceback attribute because you don't see it, but under the hood, the bytecode is actually um, deleting that attribute. So it doesn't actually, so if you pull off that exception, that exception is not going to float around with that traceback. It gets deleted, hidden underneath the covers, and it doesn't get forward unless you hold on to the exception yourself. If you do that, that's your, that you got to worry about that, but basically it's just squirreled away and really isn't a, an issue. We made sure that wasn't going to be a massive memory leak for everybody. Any other questions? Going once, going twice. Nope. Great. Thanks, everyone.